Hi everybody, welcome to Stroke Buddies Tuesday Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. Today, we're really lucky to have Bruce Hetzler, who is a um, professor of psychology and a uh, brain neuroscientist. And he's going to give us a um, talk on plasticity. And because I'm trying to keep my intros short, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Bruce. Thank you very much, Ralph. As you said, my name is Bruce Hetzler, and it is my pleasure to be here talking to you today. As Ralph said, I am a stroke survivor, so I will briefly tell you a bit about my stroke. It happened on July 18th, 2011. My wife and I had just returned from a trip to Pittsburgh. We landed in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I drove us home to Appleton, Wisconsin. My wife got out of the car, came inside our condominium, and went upstairs to take a shower while I brought the luggage in. When she came downstairs after her shower, she found me on the floor and called 911. I was transported to a hospital where it was determined that I had had a hemorrhagic stroke in my right thalamus. My wife was told the situation was dire and I would probably not be alive the next morning. A neurosurgeon drilled a hole in my head and put a tube in to drain out the blood. I was then put in a, uh, a drug-induced coma for eight days and then spent another week in the intensive care unit. My doctor later told me that when he first saw the CT scans of my brain, he assumed that I had died. I think he was wrong. <laughs> Before I came out of the coma, another neurologist told my wife that if I was that I if I survived, I would not be the same person. So she had better prepare herself. He was wrong also. I'm still the same smart aleck I was before my stroke. <laughs> now, when I came out of the coma and after the additional week in the intensive care unit, I was too weak for therapy. So I was sent to a nursing home for a month. At that time, I was in a wheelchair. I had limited use of my left arm and hand. My left shoulder was subluxed. I had double vision and unilateral neglect. That is, I tended to ignore things on the left side of my body. A doctor picked up my left arm and said, whose arm is this? And I said, Matthew, my son. Well, it was obviously wrong. He wasn't even there. It was my arm. So after a week at the nursing home, I went back to the hospital for another three weeks of therapy, both physical, occupational, and speech therapy. Although the speech therapy mainly consisted of uh, memory tests. I didn't really have a speech impediment, but they wanted to test my memory, if I recall correctly. On October 1st, 2011, I was sent home in a wheelchair. I wanted to get back to teaching at Lawrence University, but I had to take an eight hour neuropsychological test to demonstrate that I still had the cognitive abilities to teach. And I passed that with flying colors. And in fact, I have published three scientific articles since my stroke. So that, in a nutshell, is my history. And I will now begin my talk on neuroplasticity. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. I don't know if Ralph wants you to ask them along the way or wait till the end. It's entirely up to him. But here we go, neuroplasticity. The topics I'll deal with include spontaneous stroke recovery, the neuroplasticity, how to activate neuroplasticity, masked versus distributed practice, examples of neuroplasticity, 
the benefits of exercise and BDNF, that is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That is a big key. That's like miracle grow for the brain. Then learn non-use, and finally, suggested treatments. So as you know, stroke involves reductions in blood flow to the brain of sufficient duration and extent to lead to stroke, which results in damage to neuronal networks and the impairment of sensation, movement, and or cognition. Now, some spontaneous recovery does occur after a stroke, but it doesn't last forever. Spontaneous motor recovery only occurs during the first six months of recovery. And doctors today may still tell you that after six months, that's as good as you're going to get because that's what they learned in medical school. We now know that is not correct. And rehabilitation, basically work on your part, can allow you to make further progress. There is a remarkable, remarkable capacity of the adult brain to undergo plasticity that promotes recovery from stroke damage. In fact, there are parallels between plasticity mechanisms in the developing nervous system and those taking place in the adult brain. That's neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change or learn forming neural connections throughout life. From the cradle to the grave, your brain has got neuroplasticity. It's the neuroplasticity that allows neurons in your brain to compensate for injury. In simple terms, neuroplasticity is the process of rewiring the brain to perform tasks through different pathways. It forms these new neural pathways based on experiences, learning, and the environment. Neuroplasticity can even transfer functions once held in damaged parts of the brain to new healthy areas. With the right therapy, your brain can compensate for an injury and reassign functions to undamaged areas. The best way to activate neuroplasticity is with massed practice. And I'll explain that in more detail in just a minute. You can try to think of this mass practice as paving new roads in your brain. Sort of like that. <laughs> you can imagine that going on in your brain. So what's the difference between mass practice and distributed practice? Let's say you decided to do your practice four hours a day. There are two ways you could do that. One is to practice from eight in the morning till noon every single day. The other is to practice, say, from 8 to 9, then 10 to 11, 1 to 2, and 3 to 4. The first was mass practice. That was 8 a.m. till noon. That's where you have a long interval where you keep doing whatever it is you're practicing over and over. And mass practice. There you go produces far more neuroplasticity. That's the way to practice. And the more you practice an exercise, the stronger the neural pathways in your brain become. You have to be diligent about it. Neuroplasticity is the king of stroke recovery because it can help you restore most of your stroke side effects. Whatever you do over and over again, is what your brain will get better at. Here are some examples. Memory impairments can improve with mass practice of memory games or memory puzzles. I don't know about you, but when I had speech therapy, what the therapist did was basically give me memory tests that helped my memory. Mobility impairments can improve with mass practice of rehabilitation exercises. And speech impairments can improve with speech therapy exercises. Whatever you want to improve with enough practice, you should be able to regain that function. Even if you had a grim diagnosis, don't give up. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you put in the time and the effort. This is a picture of the human brain. 
This is the left side of the brain. So you're looking at the left side. Now, the part of the brain you're actually looking at is called the cerebral cortex. Cortex means bark. And just like the bark of a tree, the cerebral cortex is on the outside. In that regard, you know how you can tell that a dogwood tree is a tree? By its bark. My wife told me not to tell that joke, but I did anyway, because I like it. <laughs> hmm. This shows the different lobes of the brain. Again, this is the left side of the brain, the one in blue. And again, the brain is not normally color coded, but it's useful here. The frontal lobe is at the front of the brain. And at the posterior portion of the frontal lobe, I don't know if you can see that arrow or not, but this dark blue part is your primary motor cortex. This is the part of the brain that contains the motor neurons that control your movements. They send axons down into the spinal cord where they form connections with other neurons that go out to your muscles. And as you probably know, there is a control. That is the left side of the brain controls the movement on the right side of the body. Parietal lobe, seen in sort of an orange here, is behind the frontal lobe, and that is your somatosensory cortex. This is where you feel things, and your primary somatosensory cortex is this dark orange area. Neurons there receive information from specific parts of your body. There's a point-to-point -point correspondence between parts of your body and neurons here in this primary somatosensory cortex. You don't feel anything until these neurons are activated. Down at the bottom is the temporal lobe. This has your main auditory cortex. This is where you hear things. And back here, the very back of the brain is your occipital lobe. That's where you see things. You don't see something until information gets to the primary visual cortex. It's sent there from your eyes. Your eyes are out here in front and they send information to an internal structure called the thalamus, which is where my stroke was. And then that information is sent here to the primary visual cortex at the back of the brain. In that regard, why is it that if a boxer is hit on the chin, he sees stars? It's because the blow to the chin at the front of the brain pushes the brain up against the inside of the skull. Mm. And the inside of the skull is back here behind the occipital lobe. And this primary visual cortex hits that. And that's an abnormal way to activate the neurons here. And you see things, not people or places, but random things like stars. Now the motor and sensory cortices, now that was the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe, and the primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe were organized into what are called somatotopic maps, that is maps of your body's surface. And they have use-dependent plasticity. That is, they can be modified by experience. The motor maps reflect coupling of particular neurons uh, the control movement and the sensory maps contain neurons again that are activated by input from particular parts of the body. Now, this shows again at the upper right, you have the left side of the brain. 
and you've got in here the, uh, the well, it, here, this, this uh, sort of purple is the uh, motor cortex that controls movement. And you can draw a homunculus. A homunculus is a little person. This is the way your brain sees you in terms of the relative part of the brain that controls each body part. So you've got a very large face, especially large mouth, because you have a lot of control over your mouth functions. And you have very large hands and large feet. Now, this homunculus can be modified by experience. With a stroke, depending on what part of this part of the brain is, is damaged, the body part affected will shrink here, but you can get it back to normal or supersize it with a lot of exercise. So it's use dependent. Now, talked about exercise, there are basically three ways to change your brain. All three affect very similar parts of the brain and with two of them, you don't even have to move. How is that, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> there are three ways to improve your ability to use a body part. One is by moving it. If your hand is affected, the more you move it, the larger that hand area in the cerebral cortex gets, and therefore the better able you are to use that hand. Secondly, you can imagine that you're moving your hand. It's called mental imagery or mental practice. And third, you can watch someone else do the movement. This is called action observation. And I won't get into details here, but your brain has got what are called mirror neurons. That is neurons, that are cells in the brain that are activated, not only when you do something, but when you see someone else do it. So, now, the next slide after this one shows three panels indicating brain activity during movement, mental practice, and action observation. Okay, and here you see brain activation in the top part here occurring from when you execute a movement. Here the red during mental practice and blue at the bottom from action observation. These are functional magnetic resonance imaging. That is fMRIs. And you may have had one of these when you were in the hospital. An fMRI basically is looking at oxygen levels in the brain. And the more active an area of the brain is, the more blood flow to that area increases and therefore more oxygen is sent there. So these are really basically recordings of how much blood flow different parts of the brain are getting. Now in all three of these panels, the left-hand one shows the left hemisphere of the brain. The middle panel shows the ventral or underside of the brain. And the right panel shows the right hemisphere of the brain. And a cursory overview here shows that similar parts of the brain are activated from moving something thinking about moving that body part or seeing someone else move that body part. Kotman and colleagues published a review in 2007 showing that exercise can improve learning and memory. <laughs> Doctor, if I may. Yes. I, I believe in, and I've had some experience with reflective therapy you know, using a mirror box? Yes. Would that be an example of imagining a movement or 
No. That would be action observation. Action observation. You're observing the movement. You're not doing it, but you're observing it. Now you are observing yourself, but you, hmm. the way the mirror is set up, it looks like you're moving your, uh, your affected part. Correct. And that's a very useful type of therapy. I've got one since you're on that subject. Um, I got my hand back by imagining moving, by thinking about moving it. Um, they told me to do that and I thought, this is crazy. So I stared at my hand and thought about moving it and finally it moved about a sixteenth of an inch. I showed everybody and they went, oh wow, great. And I went, what are you kidding? Um, anyway, one of the things that I've always done was open it up with my other hand. So is that some combination of, while I'm thinking about it, I always tell people, if you're gonna move a body part, you know, uh, move your shoulder up, well, think about moving your shoulder up while you assist it. Um, could you talk about that just for a sec while we're on this subject? Well, sure, that, that is a combination of things. And you, you're, you're doing, a, having your other arm help lift your affected arm is called passive movement. It's passive because you are not doing it, but you're still activating cells in your cerebral cortex by doing it. And thinking about it will activate it almost as much as if you moved it. So that's a very good way to do it. And that's something I talk about in another talk I give on spasticity, a way to treat spasticity with passive movement. We're going to have to have you back every couple of weeks until you're tired of us. Well, I doubt <laughs> that I'll ever get tired of you. I'm just but kidding. I would be happy to give other talks if you like. Great. Well, go ahead now. Okay. Uh, this Cotman Review also... <laughs> Cotman Review also pointed out that exercise will help block inflammation, and it's important to block inflammation. Hmm. Now, this slide summarizes the Cotman Review. It points out that exercise will block inflammation. It will block insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, age-related decline, AD stands for Alzheimer's disease, PD, Parkinson's disease. But exercise will improve uh, what are called signaling cascades. And in the next slide, I'll show you sort of what I mean by that and promote plasticity, neurogenesis. Now this slide shows how antidepressants work, but the same general thing applies to the effects of exercise. In terms of antidepressants, this shows a normal neuron, just having a good time, just hanging out. <laughs> That's a cell body, there are dendrites and an axon. And I could talk about neurons in more detail in another talk if you want, but hey, stress, I'm on Zoom call. Stress causes a shrinkage of that neuron where it really doesn't function well. But then antidepressants cause an increase in norepinephrine, that's abbreviated NE, and serotonin. Serotonin is abbreviated 5-HT. It stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine, or tryptophan, excuse me. Uh, so the increase in norepinephrine and serotonin leads to a cascade of events that ultimately increases there we go BDNF that's brain derived neurotrophic factor and BDNF as I mentioned is like miracle grow for your brain that is what causes your neurons to get better 
in depression, and that's what causes the increase in uh, cells in your cerebral cortex to make you function better as a result of exercise. Now, on the flip side of uh, an improvement with exercise is learned non-use. Have you ever heard of the phrase, use it or lose it? Well, this phrase summarizes the condition of learned non-use. And learned non-use results from neglect of limbs that were affected by the stroke. So if your left hand was affected by the stroke, you can learn not to use it at all. Not good. And that's because stroke survivors may become overly dependent upon their good hand or their good leg and thereby completely, in effect, forget how to use the affected limb. Now, learn non-use occurs when the neglect becomes severe and your brain completely forgets how to use the affected hand, for example. But learn non-use doesn't happen all at once. Perhaps a stroke survivor stops using her affected hand once she washes the dishes. This isn't complete neglect, but it makes it more difficult to use the affected hand. To prevent learned not use, stroke survivors must strive to use their affected site, even if it's just a little, every single day. As long as you use it, you won't lose it. So if your left arm, left hand were affected, it's important that you try to use them, even if you can't accomplish much, because otherwise your brain will completely forget how to use them and it will be a completely useless appendage. Now, there are some suggested readings here. There is a book which you might be familiar with called Stronger After Stroke. It's now in its third edition by Peter Levine. That I found invaluable after my stroke. It provided me with a lot of information that the doctors and physiatrists never told me. This is highly recommended. Then there's The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. He's a physician and it's full of chapters dealing with changes that occur in the brain it deals with all sorts of problems. There is one chapter in particular that's good, and that chapter deals with uh, the work on uh, constraint-induced movement therapy by Dr. Taub, who's at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And there's an entire chapter on that you would find very interesting. Finally, My Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor. That's another neuroscientist who had a stroke. She had a stroke in her left hemisphere and uh, caused her to see the world in a different way. She gave a TED talk that you might find interesting to see. So that is the end of my talk. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about what I've addressed or anything else related to brain function. Why don't you oh. unshare un the screen then, unless you think you need to refer back to it. I make every, don't the, think so. Pardon? Well, then unshare, it'll make everybody's picture bigger for people that are watching it on YouTube. Okay. Doctor, if I may, Will you go back to will you go back to your earlier comment about where it's doctors commonly say, you know, your first six months, if you don't get it back, you're not gonna. And you made a comment that that's what they're taught in medical school. You know, that is a dangerous comment, and I've heard it from doctors, I'm sure many of us have, and maybe you have. 
I mean, why, why, why is that? And well, I, I can't comment too specifically. Now, I, I've got a PhD in neurobiology. I was in the course of doing that. I did take some classes at the at the Northwestern University Medical School in neuroanatomy, neuropharmacology, and things like that. But now this was uh, this was. 40 years ago, except about 45 years ago. And at that time, all they knew about was the spontaneous recovery. They did not know about neuroplasticity. So at that time, what medical students were taught was that after six months, that's as good as it gets. It was not until years later that neuroplasticity in particular, beginning with the work of Edward Taub, and his research began with work on monkeys, and uh, then he progressed to doing therapy on humans, uh, demonstrated neuroplasticity. So I know when I had my stroke, my physician told me after about six months, he said, well, that's the way it's gonna be because that's what he had learned in medical school. And depending on how old your doctor is, uh, they may not be informed about the neuroplastic changes that can still occur. Your brain retains its neuroplasticity from the cradle to the grave. So if you're not dead, then your brain can change. Yeah. Mm. Dennis, one thing I've noticed is that um, I'm, I'm glad Bruce brought up age because the times I've been told that the doctors tended to be older and um, the, the times I've heard it also tended to come from the doctors. The nurses, maybe because they're younger or they change out or they got different education, the nurses won't tell you that. In fact, I've actually had a couple of nurses say things like, Oh no no that's not that's not right. So the nurses seem to know, and the older doctors don't. And you know, we could have a couple hour meeting on why doctors get set in their ways, but they do. Anyway, so that's just an ob observation. Um, it's funny because I looked, Bruce. I looked. Uh, uh, I spent twenty minutes or half an hour going through your presentation this morning, trying to think of questions and. And I came up with a couple, but um, then when you did your presentation, I came up with a whole bunch more. Oh, boy. Because of things that you said. Um, I asked one of them about um, combining moving uh, with uh, thinking. Um, one other thing that um, I've always kind of preached was that form is more important then quality is more important than um, quantity. And when um, you get tired or you're either in the brain or in the muscles and you can no longer do something very well, I, I teach people it's time to stop because I, I'm concerned about um, bad patterning as opposed to good patterning. Could you talk about that for just a sec? Certainly. It is true that when you get tired and you start doing things poorly, it's probably time to stop. But you have to be careful and not use that as an excuse. For example, at Edward Taub's clinic in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, if you go for treatment, you are treated on a Monday through Friday for four hours a day, whatever block of time that might be, it could be from noon until four in the afternoon, five days a week, Monday through Friday. You're with a therapist for four hours and he or she is having you do exercises for legs or for arms, hands, whatever, for four hours straight. 
Now you're paying for that and it's not covered by insurance. It's expensive, but you know, you, he or she might give you a little break or to get water or something, but you can't say, oh, I'm tired. I'm going to stop for today. You really continue. You do want to do things as best you can, but even doing it poorly is better than not doing it at all. So uh, if your left arm is affected and you just that day you're tired to raise your arm, you don't miss your therapy, you gotta pay for it anyway. So you go in and you do as best you can with what he or she is instructing you to do. Again, hmm. perfect practice is best, but imperfect practice is better than no practice. Because the more you use that body part, the more change will occur in your brain. Okay, so I actually, being a maniac that I am before the stroke and at least half a maniac, I'm at least half as intense post-stroke, um, I just decided I was just going to just go at this and get better. And so I actually did which more like 10 hours a day. I, I worked on my recovery from 7 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. at night. Now, I had to eat meals, but I, it, I um, as soon as I could, I'm a big believer in washing the dishes, doing anything you can with, uh, with your affected parts. And I tell people, no matter how slow it is, how ugly it is, just keep doing it. So anyhow, because of, you know, so intense, I ended up doing a lot of physical therapy and I, I, I actually got it pretty much, you know, done in a year or so. I did it for about 15 months and then I revolted. So in a sense, I'm, uh, was doing a form of mass, um, now, I'd heard that you should rest your brain a little bit. So what I did was I'd work like 50 minutes and I'd lay down for 10 minutes. I never went to sleep. I just laid there. I heard that connections keep being made after you're finished exercising or performing a task. So I would lay there and let my brain recover for five or 10 minutes, never go to sleep, and then go back at it. Um, well, that's reasonable. Again, uh... Uh, working 10 hours is, is very impressive, I must say. Uh, I'm envious of you. And I would personally be better off in my stroke recovery if I hadn't gone back to teaching because I was spending all that time preparing lectures and grading exams and stuff like that rather than exercising. But I was able to return to my job, which I love doing. So it was good. Uh, attitude and persistence. Or what pay off? So um, I lucked into a viable strategy, if you will. By yes. Intense. Absolutely. And would you say the way I did it, 50 minutes on, 10 minutes off, was that qualify as mass in the sense that I'd go back at it? Yes. Yes, that is true. Because again, uh, <laughs> at the job clinic, if you need to stop and go to the bathroom or drink some water, or just rest a little while, that's fine. But the key is to do it as much as you can. Well, I had doctor's appointments and things, but what I, and I couldn't drive in the beginning. Uh, well, I probably could, but they wouldn't let me. Um, I didn't have my license taken away. Everybody just said it's not a good idea right now. And when I got in the car, I went to turn my head to look behind me to back up, and I found out I couldn't turn my neck. So I had to work on sure much of my chin to my shoulders uh, before I could drive any anyway um, it um, one of the things that I did when I was pushing that hard was I was concerned that I might be doing some damage to my brain in some way you know um, when we don't know things we can conjure up things to worry about and 
So I talked to my neurologist about this and I said, you know, I'm really pushing it hard. Is that a good idea? And he actually said, yes. And I said, well, how do I know if I'm pushing too hard? And he smiled at me and said, your brain will let you know. Uh, <laughs> would you uh, agree that it's a good idea that if you are able to, it's a good idea to push yourself hard? Yes, it, it is a good idea. Now, it is possible to overwork your muscles also. Uh, and again, you're, you can cause muscle pain by over using them. I forget what it's called, something like late onset muscle pain or, or something like that. So that can happen, but very few people do that. And again, your muscles will let you know and your brain will let you know when you get tired when you get tired it is time to rest and at night when you're asleep is when uh, the most change occurs in your brain so a good night's sleep is important after exercising a lot that will help consolidate the changes okay <clears throat> concerned about my brain. I knew when my muscles got tired. So one of the things that I did was um, at each of those periods, one of them I would walk and then I would do hand and then I would do arm and shoulder and then I'd go back to walking and I mixed them up. And if I ever had any muscle stuff, I would uh, avoid whatever was causing that and try and do something else, work another muscle that wasn't um, worn out, but I never, sure. I kind of almost never stopped um, working my brain. Now, one thing I noticed was that, and I know, I'm sure you, you may even, um, I bet you do know the scientific or medical term for it. I experience things to this day. Okay, so I asked my neurologist, I'll get back to that, this is part of it. So I asked my neurologist, and interestingly enough, my stroke was right there, right smack in the middle of that motor band. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, um, so what's, what happened? You know, in a bleed, uh, the blood is toxic to the brain, so it kills those brain cells. It's a different type of death than starvation, but it's still death of brain cells. So I said, what's going to happen there? He said, oh, those brain cells are gone. They're dead. They're gone. They're not going to regenerate. You're not going to be able to retrain them. And I said, so how's this work? When, you know, how am I going to learn how to walk? And he said, basically, you're going to use other parts of your brain because of, he didn't say the word neuroplasticity, but that I recall, but he could have. Um, he said, your brain has the ability, other parts of your brain have the ability to um, relearn tasks that they weren't normally meant to the to do that they'll take over for the part of the brain that's damaged and i found that to be true i also found that maybe they aren't quite as good at it because i experienced something that i call um running out of brain um so i can do like certain tasks like i can walk fine okay but if you put things in both my hands and make me go up the steps without being able to even see a railing um, I'm looking at my steps that don't have a railing. Um, it's like I don't have enough brain to think about walking. I'm, uh, fear, I think, plays a big thing. Fear will come in and take up some part of your brain. So whenever we're doing things that we're not comfortable with, I think that helps eat up some of your brain. So what I experience is, for example, when I carry two full plates, dinner plates, my, hand, my left hand will shake some. Okay, so I can stop walking and I can stop the plate. Okay, I can keep walking with the plate stopped, but I'll drag my foot. I can walk fine, but the plate will shake. I don't seem to have enough brain to be able to do both tasks. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, first, you talked about the neurologist saying, parts of the brain can take over function. And I've mentioned that in my presentation. And for movement, that is often neurons on the other side of the brain taking over. Because we talk about contralateral control, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. 
But let's see, how can I explain this? Um, about uh, 90% of the control of the left side of your body comes from the right side of your brain, but there's still about 10% from the left side of your brain that controls the left side of the body. And if the right side of your brain is damaged, well, that's when your left arm has problems. But, and if those neurons are damaged in the right side, <laughs> neurons on the left side can grow stronger. And even though normally they only uh, produce 10% of the movement, they can develop more and more and more of it through exercise. Now, another comment you made about uh, those neurons are gone, they're damaged, they can never regrow. That's true, but now that varies depending on whether you had an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. In a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, there's a, a stroke uh, core that, that's damaged, that's dead. In an ischemic stroke, you have a core of dead neurons, but it's surrounded by a penumbra. The penumbra is a group of neurons that are damaged, but not dead. And as the blood supply returns to those in the penumbra, they return and can allow you to recover function. So, in that sense, it's easier to recover from an ischemic than a hemorrhagic stroke. However, there's another caveat. <laughs> In general, although a hemorrhagic stroke is more likely to be fatal than a same-sized ischemic stroke, recovery from a hemorrhagic stroke is generally better than the same-sized ischemic stroke so it's not it's not simple well i, I did have a hemorrhagic stroke so he yes. was correct in saying that part of my 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 brain um was dead was dead and um i actually discovered and i'm it's one of the things on my radar screen what you're talking about uh i'd heard 15 but you know you're the you're the scientist so 10's in the realm I'd heard that 10% of the neurons fired go to the same side. And uh, since then, I discovered it by, um, well, I'm always fooling around. So I was making potato salad and I had three potatoes. And I'd recently learned how to pick up three tennis balls in order to demonstrate neuroplasticity at 11 and a half years. And so I looked at the three potatoes, and I guess I saw the three tennis balls, and I thought, well, instead of picking them up one at a time and adding them and then dropping them one at a time, which is the way I learned to do the tennis balls, I said, so what would happen if I just tried to pick them all up? And so I got my wife, I didn't do any takes, any practice, I got my wife to film it, and I put my hand down, it took me about six seconds to grab the potatoes. Then I did it with my right hand in about a half a second. And the second time I did it with my affected hand, it took like about two seconds. And I got on to, I don't want to get too deep or above other people's understanding. And not I understand not everybody's trying to figure all this stuff out like I am. But I discovered ipsilateral patterning as opposed to bilateral patterning. Um, I used a lot, a lot of... of I used a lot of bilateral patterning to do things like get my hand back because I noticed that when I did it with my affected hand, I won't demonstrate, never demonstrate, I learned something, never demonstrate anything with your affected side. Somehow I did it early on and I, I like lost a week or two, reconnected with some midterm stuff that I had going on in my brain. So anyhow, my fingers would fire all crazy and one day I just said, so what happens if I do them both? Well, it wasn't perfect on the left, but it was a lot better. So I started doing like five like this and then five by itself. And when it fell apart, I'd repattern. I could actually, I can actually show people, but I've done it a number of times. If, um, so I'm wondering if you saying that, you know, a lot of times in movement that 
the brain cells that end up controlling it are often on the same side instead of the opposite side. So I'm wondering if, if um, I helped that with the bilateral patterning because I knew nothing about ipsilateral versus contralateral at that time. I would say that you did, yes. Okay. So um, if anybody doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I will do this just quickly since we actually have time. So the only thing I do behind my head here is put my hair back, okay? I don't, you know, scratch my neck. If I do, I usually do it with my right hand. So I don't do much with my left hand. Let me get a little further back. I don't do much with my left hand behind my head. So I'm not very good at this. If I'm making faces, it's like, doesn't hurt at all. It's like brain strain. I get pissed off at myself that I can't do this very well, and I concentrate. So look, there's a concentrating face already. Okay. Oh, look at all that shake. Uh, I can't do any better than that. Okay. okay. Now watch. Hey, doctor, if I may. Yes. Let's go back to, you mentioned BDNF. Yes. And you, re you referred to it as the miracle grow for the brain. Boy, I want some more. I want some of that. Can you, can you go a little bit deeper on what BDNF is? Well, it's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And it is a chemical that is released in the brain, either because of the effects of an antidepressant or because of the effects of exercise. So if you do exercise, let's say with your right hand, then in the right hand portion of your brain, you're going to get BDNF released and that will cause that right hand portion of your brain to grow in size. So it's specific with, with exercise, it's specific to the part of your brain that you are using. Now, antidepressants are not specific to a particular part of the brain. And actually research has shown that in roughly the, um, I think it's the first year of recovery from a stroke, if you are taking an antidepressant like uh, Prozac, or actually in my case, I was prescribed Lexapro uh, during the first year. That promotes improvement in brain functioning by causing the release of BDNF throughout the brain. And that aids in stroke recovery in general uh, during the first year. That's all research has shown. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, I, ha as it was, a I had an ischemic stroke four and a half years ago, and at the time when I was in the hospital, the neur neurosurgeon said to me that uh, when the, like, I'm not using medical terms, when it uh, burst, it caused a bit of a spray, and the spray grazed or nicked thalamus. And as a result, for four and a half years, I have significant pain um, head to toe on the affected side. And I've tried a number of different things. Um, I'm not a big fan of medicine, but I did try various things. But the negative of the side effects outweighed anything that was even remotely positive. My question to you is, in the course since I've had this stroke in that first year, I found that my, the pain level seems to follow a pattern where it never goes below on a scale of one to 10. I never go below a seven. The highest is a 10. And every other day, I'm at a seven. And then within that 24 hour period, it creeps up to the 10. The very next day, it goes back down to a seven. So for four and a half years, I'm sort of on a loop. And 
I was wondering, is that something, given the fact that you mentioned that you had a thalamus, is that something that occurs for those of us that have that? that that's a very good question. And there is a syndrome called thalamic pain syndrome. And my stroke was in my thalamus. And frankly, I was lucky that I never developed thalamic pain syndrome. Wow. But many stroke survivors do. Now, as far as I know, there is no pain medication that is effective in treating thalamic pain syndrome. Correct. I think that at present, the only treatment that is effective is mindfulness meditation. That seems to be the only thing that helps relieve it. Hmm. Well, what I have done in the course of, you know, trial and error, I sort of, um, you know, my, the neurosurgeon initially said to me, um, it's going to take time in a year's time. It's going to get less. Well, it actually was the opposite in a year's time. It got significantly worse. So I changed my way of thinking. And instead of waiting for this pain to dissipate, I started to psychologically say to myself, well, maybe I have to partner with it and sort of not necessarily accept it out of defeat, but to embrace it and how can I live with it? And I started to develop my own little toolbox, so to speak, of coping, uh, whether I could get my attention off of it for five, five percent, that was like a big plus, so on and so forth. If one is, and so now I have certain things like distractions, or if I'm trying to do something, some tedious thing, something that draws my attention away. And mindfulness is also, I have done some meditation, et cetera. Would you add anything to that, to what I'm? I, I think you're doing an excellent job. And uh, people see that I have a PhD. It's technically psychology, but it's actually neurobiology. And if I say I've got a PhD in psychology, then they start telling me their clinical problems. And, and I said, well, I'm the sort of psychologist that can't help anybody. And frankly, uh, I, I, I don't really know all the details of uh, what sort of mental things will help thalamic pain syndrome, but I know there's no medication right. or other physical thing that will help. I've just read that uh, mindfulness meditation was the only thing that worked. And it sounds like what you're doing is about the best you can. It's your attitude, your ability to focus elsewhere and get on with your life, really. Right, right. And what I have come across in the medical community, uh, also like even when I've done OT and PT, uh, and I have shared this, I think they come away thinking that I have created in my own mind, sort of an anticipatory that I know that tomorrow is going to be a seven, whereas I knew today was a 10. And I take a front by that because um, if anything, I get up every day saying, hmm, may, I don't, maybe today will be a better day. And I don't really focus and tell myself, okay, tomorrow is going to be a seven. The next day is going to be a 10. It's just that just by, by chance, I discovered that there is this sort of loop um, in, in which it follows. And um, it's very difficult when you're in, trying to deal with doctors in the medical community about this thing, because I think they almost infer that it's learned behavior on my part, that I've, I've come to anticipate it. And as opposed to, to me, I believe knowledge is power and you don't always get the answers you want and they're not the answers you like but at least having a better understanding. And I, I feel that, that I am on some sort of a loop, which I don't imagine can be interrupted. Uh, well, you sound, you sound smarter than a lot of doctors that I know. <laughs> and, but if you, one thing you could try is when, it, you know, you, when you have a seven the next morning and you think you might 
be in for another t for a 10, well, maybe that would be the time to make sure you practice mindfulness um, that morning. Um, I never thought about it before, but I have paresthesia on my face and my hand. And um, now that I'm talking about it, I'm aware of it. But I actually kind of train my brain most of the time to not think about it because I tried different medications and I was Yeah, on, they just don't work. They don't yeah. work. I was on gabapentin. Yeah, I got rid of oh. a third of it, but I didn't want to take six pills for the rest of my life to get rid of a third right. of it. So I weaned right. myself off of it and it got slightly more intense. And then over a couple of year period, I just learned not to focus on it. Of course, right now, yeah. right now I'm going... Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I have I have a uh, severe uh, numbing, tingling, and in the last year, uh, I I don't know if it's you would call it spasticity, but I can actually feel uh, in the whole right side of my body internally the limbs, every muscle. I could feel every fiber as if somebody took a wet towel and was wringing it. So everything is hypersensitive and that has added to the wonderful mix of, you know, how I started out was just, I don't want to say just, it was pins and needles. And over time, it obviously has progressed and I have read up on it. And I know that that's kind of the course of the way how things can go. So I am a big believer in mindfulness. And I was wondering not to take up anybody much, too much of anybody else's time. No, no. Can someone elaborate to me on more different types of mindfulness that I might be missing and not thinking about trying? Meditation. Meditation. Yeah. I mean, um, um, I've got um, some friends who are big believers in it. I've, my best friend from high school, um, has been meditating for 50 years and has a spiritual show. And, you know, there are a whole bunch of people that just find that mindfulness. Well, I mean, that's what we're talking about. The brain has the ability to learn different things. The brain's a powerful thing if you can figure out um, how to harness it. That's why I was, was talking about all these different kinds of patterning because Again, yeah. like you, I'm trying to observe things, figure out what works, and figure out how to harness them into, you know, better recoveries. Yeah, I mean, it's like as I'm listening and participating in all of this, and this is, by the way, this is a hugely, uh, very informative, uh, Doctor, a great presentation, and Ralph, thank you for putting all this together. Um, obviously, I'm I'm experiencing a lot of pain, but people are always surprised when they meet me because they say that I don't, they wouldn't know that I'm in the pain. And I always, I never look at it as like you know, some kind of a martyr or some hero. I think it's more just a, a means of wanting to survive, a way, finding a way to survive. And because it's either you let it beat you or you find a way. I almost, almost now have to mentally, emotionally, I, I lean into it and accept it. It's an unwelcome partner and a part of my life. So now what am I going to do with it? How am I going to, you know, achieve a quality of life for myself? So I guess in what my takeaway from what you were saying and with, with the doctor, what you're saying is, is mindfulness and would be also something me to really key perhaps more in than what I have been doing. Yes. Um, and also you, you mentioned pins and needles and that yes. is a common uh, sensation that people have. It is possible to re-educate your senses. How so? Now, well, let's say you're talking about your right hand. I'm just making this up. But let's say you've got this pins and needles sensation in your right hands, your right hand. You can re-educate the senses from your right hand by rubbing it across surfaces of different textures. Okay. Like a silk handkerchief versus sandpaper versus uh, sure. ball, a bucket of ball bearings or, or whatever. Or you can uh, put your right hand under uh, or in cold water mm -hmm. and hot water mm -hmm. by varying the senses 
that your right hand is exposed to, you can re-educate it to sense things properly and not just feel this pins and needles. Or eat the salad. That's, that's very interesting. Now, just, just to tag a little PS to what Ralph was saying, when, if someone like myself was to in, try to engage in all of that, Ralph, you were talking about how you spend a tremendous amount of, you know, you were doing eight, 10 hours or whatever. It, it is more quantity in terms of sensory? Should I be doing that on a, quite often throughout the day, uh, chunks of time? Well, again, I, again massed uh, usage is better. So do it as much as you can for like four hours. Okay. You know, Hot water, cold water, hot water, cold water, silk, sandpaper, uh, marbles, just, just vary it as much as you can over the course of four hours uh, See, a, a day. Thank you, because I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Thank you for saying that because I have been trying that, but nowhere near for the amount of time that you or Ralph have been talking about. I've only, I've done it for short periods of time. 20 minutes, maybe a half hour. So I, okay. That, that really doesn't, okay. It doesn't do the trick. You, okay. You, you gotta do it more than that. If you're going to do the neuro, neuroplastic changes that are necessary to change your sensation. Okay. That's very interesting. Cause I was going to say to you, Joanne, I would encourage you to do it, but I tried it. I tried rubbing my hand on, uh, metal like an outdoor uh, table with the metal grate, uh, right? Sandpaper, fur, tickling it with feathers, all kinds of stuff. But I never did it for more than well. First of all, I don't know. I have pretty intense um, tingling and such. Um, I found I couldn't stand it. If you if you notice, I was shaking my head when you said hot water, cold water. Yeah. If I pick up a, a, you know, like ice cube tray with my left hand, I'm lucky to be able to have it for five seconds in my hand before right. my brain right. says, "Get that damn thing out of here." <laughs> it over, put it down. So I, I did try that, and I thought it didn't work, but I didn't know anything about you know mass practice. Well, you know, there I was, that there I was doing it in other ways. Uh, because I accidentally discovered it, but in terms of this, nobody gave me any guidance, and I, I guess right. I was thinking it was more important to walk than to get rid of um, the right. tingling in my hand. So I focused more on the walking and the shoulder movement, and and so right, than right. Than I did. I don't know. So if we have that's an interesting forever. That's good. No, no, I'm sorry to talk over you. I, th I think you're making an excellent point. And, and, and I, this is my takeaway from here that I, I have, I've only, you know, done a tinge of the amount of time that I should be addressing for these sensory exercises. And also uh, someone in uh, just an OT just suggested that I try the mirror therapy. And, and uh, you know, I guess, after a while you get kind of jaded and you say, oh, nothing's going to work. And I think though that, I think that, that my takeaway from all of this is that some of the things I'm doing is good, but I, if I want to see or possibly hope to see results, I need to do it a heck of a lot longer session than what I've been doing. So thank you very much. So most people, um, I've never done mirror box therapy, but I run two groups and I post and monitor about, I don't know, six or eight more. And so I kind of like filter comments and most people will tell you that they didn't get that much out of mirror box therapy. I have a, a, right. an idea. I, I don't think they put in the time because the other people who say that they got something out of it say it's really, really boring and you have to do it like forever and, and you know, for months and months and months to see results. But I finally got some results. I want to ask a question because you see now I'm thinking about, well, maybe I should give this whole, you know, uh, rubbing and sensory um, <laughs> uh, fooling a, another attempt. Now who's got four hours a day. So in, here's a question, doctor, in terms of this mass um, practice. So if you were able to do four hours one day, would that be better than doing um, 
one hour a day for four days if you only did it four hours a day if you could do it four hours a day every four days is that better than an hour a day every day yes it is okay i thought so but i, I figured i would <laughs> be expert <laughs> So I'm Ralph, doing, I mean, who's got four hours a day to rub their, you know, to rub fur? <laughs> Not me. Maybe I could set it up while I'm answering stroke questions. Anyway. Uh, well, you know what it is I do? Um, uh, one of the things that I'm constantly doing is uh, I'm moving my hand like this, and I never realized that I was kind of doing it. It was sort of um, something that I do. It's always like you, you're trying to shake the 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 pain pins and needles and the pain away and i two things i'll i'll just end quickly with uh i belong to a local stroke group and i a gentleman was sitting across the table from me and he must have been observing me and he goes you have sensory pain i go yeah and he goes because he does the same thing he's constantly doing this blah 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 and the last thing i'll say there was a, a gentleman that i met he lives on the West Coast. He's in his 30s, single guy, you know, um, he works. And he has the same exact cycle of pain that I have, where one day it's a seven and another day it's a 10. And so for him, he, on the days that his pain level, you know, so to speak, is less, is the day that he's planning all his social activities uh, not out of defeat that knowing that the next day is going to be a 10. He doesn't anticipate it, but he figures it's going to be that way. So he's gotten to the point where he tries to do most all of what he wants to do on a day when it, when the pain level is just a, a little bit bearable. And people will say to me, Joanne, seven, that's horrible. But yes, it is. It's high. But if you've had a, pa a pain level 10, uh, seven, seven is really good. And, and I guess my goal in life is I'm just looking to shave off that 10 a little bit. I've accepted that I'm going to have it the rest of my life. I don't accept it out of defeat because I don't think that takes you anywhere. Uh, it's just a reality. But I think, you know, you have to work with what you have and just try to see if you can fine tune it. And I'm going to stop talking and let everyone else chat in and thank you very much for at least showing me that I, I, I need to spend more time on doing that rather than a 20 minute or a half hour clip. So that I will do. So Joanne, this is my whole thing. Okay. I'm an observer and you're obviously paying attention. You're obviously um, a good observer and you're also good at, at connecting dots and drawing conclusions. And, you know, my whole thing has been about observing what's happening with me and then what happened with the people that I work with. And I don't, it seems to me like that all of us as stroke survivors, we are engaged in this um, kind of observation and figuring out things for ourselves. Now you're talking about other people who had the same cycle, whatever. So my whole thing is to try and bring this to, you know, get the people that are doing this and bring them together and end up with some common knowledge from our side of things because guess what in therapy and stuff they're not teaching you this stuff i did a post in young stroke on proprioception a couple of people were asking about it and i wrote some comments and i said well if everybody's interested they're not going to find these comments so i made a, a a post on it and somebody came back and said you know thank you very much this is the this is great information and I'm not getting taught it in physical therapy. Yeah, because they're not stroke survivors. I think there's something to the fact that we as stroke survivors can observe and bring something to the to the recovery party. And that's, you know, what I'm basically trying to do. And then, and I think you're doing a great job. And I, I consider myself very fortunate to have made that connection with you and then via through that this is the first time i've actually been able to participate in one of these events that that you uh formulate and create and i think that doctor what you have said today and how you presented yourself and the things was very it's not as if i haven't heard those things before but yeah. you, you crystallized it and and exactly exactly and you you really i i i feel immensely 
grateful and thankful to have had the chance to um, be part of this and to listen to what everyone has to say. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done talking. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you got something out of it. Yeah. Well, hey, Doctor, I, I have two quick follow-ups to what you were been talking about. I want to do some research, so I want to make sure I got this right. Philamic pain syndrome? Is that it? Philamic? Philamic. P-H-A-L-A-M-I-C. Philamic. It's about the thalamus. That's a structure in the brain. So P-H-A-L-A-M-I-C. P-H-A-L-A-M-I-C. Thalamic. And, and just syndrome. to follow up on this uh, BDNF, did I understand you to say that antidepressants accelerate the release of this chemical? Yes. But you said only for one year. Why only one year? How? Well, no, well, antidepressants do that for a long time, but they only seem to help stroke recovery in the first year after the stroke. That's uh, interesting. That's interesting because I was put on um, uh, Zoloft mm -hmm. and um, I, I, I think it, the way I liken it is as if, you know, you're, you're as if you have, if you've, and this has nothing to do with vision, but this is just my example. If you're a person that needs glasses and, but you're wearing the wrong pair of glasses and you don't see as well. And then suddenly when you get the right pair of glasses, you see well. And when I started taking Zola, it's sort of, I didn't know that, that I wasn't feeling just quite as right. My I but I, oh my God, I apologize. It's my dog. Um, but anyway, I find that the, the Zoloft, I think it sort of made me just feel, helped me to feel more like me. It didn't, you know, it just kind of made things better. I cannot know how to explain it, but that's interesting. I never heard of that before about in the first year mm -hmm. that uh, antidepressants. I didn't hear about that. Okay. Well, I think maybe we should wrap this up. I don't want to take too much of Bruce's time. I'm going to quickly do that demo because I didn't finish it. And patterning is something that I think everybody can learn oh, something okay. from. So basically um, what you're doing when I did this was I would uh, I would do them together, then I would do the one separately. When it fell apart, I'd do them together again. So here's what happens. So I'm terrible at doing this. I won't belabor this. Actually, that's a little better than last time. It is. Nice and smooth. Everybody should be muted. Mine's so everybody stopping. can see that. Big difference, right? Yes. Okay, here's the takeaway. Wow. Oh, I got four. Okay, so when the fifth one falls apart, what do you do? You go back to this. And then you do oh. this. Very good. Bilateral Very, patterning. Ex excellent. I, if I figure out ipsilateral patterning, I'll let everybody know I'm still working <laughs> on it. Sounds good. Uh, Bruce, I'm going to send you a video I call Three Potatoes because I had I did record the very first time I ever did that. I'm a big okay. believer in reality. If you watch my YouTube channel, um, oh, like when I take the vitamins out, I spilled like 50 vitamin Ds and my cameraman goes, take two. And I go, nope, reality. And I picked every vitamin D uh, with my uh, and put them back in. Cause I want people to understand I'm a stroke survivor. I'm not perfect. I don't do this stuff perfect, but you can get better. When they look at me, they say, oh, I wish I could do that. Well, I'm not perfect. I, I don't do anything perfectly. Um, I still have stroke issues, but I've learned to live with them. I've learned to be happy. And, and you I, don't quit. And I don't quit. So that's, uh, that's always a good takeaway because Bruce will certainly agree that attitude is... Uh, is, that is uh, very important. Yeah. yeah. I, by the way, I had a neurologist out come up to me after um, a motivational speech I, I gave a number of times, and uh, he said, more movement equals less depression. 
He said it's mm. a scientific fact. So there you go. More movement equals less depression because you're doing things with your brain. The other thing is if you build it into like exercise and you set small goals, then you're being successful and success builds on success. So that's the way to get yourself heading down that road. So Bruce, what can I say? Except we want you back. We're not Absolutely. We're tired of way before we get tired of you. Thank you, Bruce. You are most welcome. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. Well, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. You are most welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll see everybody next week, and this will go up on YouTube. And I'm just going to keep um, I'm onto this thing about some experts who had strokes because I think they have a unique perspective having experienced it from, well, I, I, I met a doctor, Dennis introduced me, he left, and I started thinking about the concept of both sides of the bed. Well, in Bruce's case, both sides of the brain or a physical therapist, both sides of the leg or both sides of the hand in terms of an occupational therapist. They understand, Bruce understands things that other neuroscientists may know from book learning, but he has a different reality. It's a different reality. Different perspective. Having, having suffered a stroke. Mm -hmm. and yes. So that's another part of this whole plan, because see, if, if we all can collectively observe stuff and put it together, what is science? Science is nothing more than collective observation, okay? When you observe enough, it, something becomes a rule so if it continues to obey all of the other rules of science, then we accept it. So my idea is to somehow build this knowledge base that we have as stroke survivors and then take it back to the physical therapists, occupational therapists, neurologists, doctors, whoever needs, who's ever not getting trained in neuroplasticity. No therapist has ever mentioned the word neuroplasticity to me in any of the times I've been or any of the number of times I've taken other stroke survivors to therapy. Now, the one that I like that's NDT trained, neurodevelopment trained, she starts with the brain and figures out the exercise. The rest of them start with the exercise because that's what it says in the book and the brain kind of not be damned, but it better get on board or it's not going to work. So anyway, I recently, I, I'm sorry, just one last thing in, in, to PS to what you're saying. I recently took a refresher of, for uh, OT. Mm -hmm. And when I presented to the OT, you know, about the thalamic pain and how, uh, how I'm experiencing it and there's a cycle and blah, blah, blah. Um, they started, they did for a few weeks, they concentrated on that and was trying to do different things. And then she said to me uh, after about the fifth session, she says, well, I don't see that any of this is really working. So we're going to move in another direction. So with that, you know, I became upset and I just looked at her very calmly and I said, you know, if I were someone that was maybe newly had a stroke and three months, what you just said could, could really crush someone's spirit. I said, I'm four and a half years into this, and I don't believe what you're saying. And I said to her, with all due respect, I said, you need to be careful about what you say to people. Because you can really sit there and tell someone, well, I've tried five sensory things with you for five days, and it hasn't worked. So, you know, we're just going to move in a different direction. That's damaging. And you want to say, that's what I think, Ralph, is what is the education that will come in with what you're doing is because we do look to them for help and guidance. And a lot of times they can just really cut somebody off literally at the knees if, you, if, you know, if you're not smart enough to know that they don't know what they're talking about. Well, yeah. I'm almost 18 years out and I'm still getting gains from back from where I was. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right. And I, am I am too. Tiny little things that you suddenly didn't notice. And you say, wait a minute, didn't my finger just do something different than I wasn't doing before? So you're absolutely right. 18 years. God bless. Well, and last week we were talking about this and 
with Sherry Morant, who's a um, occupational therapist who has a stroke, and she said it fundamentally changed her practice. And we were talking about neuroplasticity in terms of the brain likes to be challenged. It likes different routines. So you go to physical therapy, they give you this uh, routine based on the book. It works great because you're a newbie and it's challenging mm -hmm. your brain. So the curve goes up like this. But as you keep doing that same thing, it starts rounding off, rounding off, and then it gets kind of almost flat. And then they start talking about graduating you. Well, right. so what Sherry I'm not, <clears throat> and I ended up uh, saying in a private conversation, and then we, I made sure it made it into the group, was they plateaued you. That's like, right. It's not like you plateau. It's like they can plateau you by not mixing it up enough. That's right. Bruce, you got any comments on that before we sign off? Well, a plateau will invariably occur if you keep doing the same thing over and over. It's just like a normal learning curve where you get better and better and your rapid increases no matter what you're learning. And then it levels off and your increments are smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, in therapy, they call it a plateau and it's like, okay, you're out of here. What they need to do is change it so you're learning something different. Correct. And you make great gains quickly. Right. Excellent point. Excellent. And um, Joanne, I've got a friend of mine, William Lowe, who I do a group called Stroke Roadmap with. He's yes, I know. On, he's coming on in a few weeks, and we did this in Roadmap. Maybe this would be a good subject for him, uh, for he and I to talk about in that at meeting, or one of them. We're looking for a, a, a few. Uh, patterning might be one. Um, got something that we're both working on separately and together called a progression because I think it's basically there's a progression and you kind of you can swip, swap a few things out but you really can't do something over here until you get done with some things over here so maybe we'll talk about uh, about this in uh, in a few weeks and that'd be great doctor I'm, I'm, I, I, I thought I knew the answer and I'm I'm glad that um, you can confirm that a lot of times what I do here is ask questions that I know the answer to so that the uh, people out there can hear it from you rather than me because I've been, you know, I've been yammering this stuff for five years. I'm finally getting, um, I'm finally getting some attention from all the shouting I'm doing and I'm happy with that. And I'm well, you're getting well-deserved recognition. Well, thank you. Um, and I'm going to keep at it because uh, my goal is actually to fundamentally change stroke recovery. And I think we can do it from our side because they're not paying attention to us. It's all top down. Insurance companies, the medical books, the training they get, it all comes from the top down. And, um, you know, the way the, um, the NDT trained therapists work is they start with the brain and they figure out what to do based on your situation, how the brain works and what's best. They don't try and do this top down application. It's kind of like just, you know, painting it with the color it says to paint it in the book. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well right. said. I, I managed to get up on my soapbox. I, I, um, I don't know if everybody knows, but I'll do stuff like zip it. I, I um, I do like hand signals like yes, yes, or me. It's so that I don't <laughs> uh, talk. <laughs> it's a good, it's a way to not interrupt Bruce when he's talking. I'll <laughs> point at myself or whatever. Um, and the part of the point of having all these experts on is I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert. Well, I have a degree, you know, I had a stroke. I have the ultimate degree in stroke recovery, I suppose. I said that to my, a uh, friend of mine said that to me when I said sometime, I, one time, I, I don't feel like I know what I'm doing because I'm not educated. Anyway, um, Bruce, thank you a bunch, and uh, we'll have you back. You and I will talk about, uh, about that because um, we actually have you scheduled two weeks from now, and I'll either have you back if that works for you or juggle the schedule around and bring you back when it's more convenient. He's, Bruce has several other presentations. I love this one. Um, 
you know, beyond the, first of all, it was the biggest group we've had. And beyond the 20 people that were here, you know, it's going to get uh, hundreds of hits on YouTube. Um, well, good. And that's, a lot of people, stroke survivors are hesitant to come to these things uh, for whatever reasons. Um, so, you know, I've had to um, adjust my thinking in terms of YouTube hits because it'll be there forever and this isn't going to change. So somebody two years from now can watch this and benefit just as much as we did today. So I'd like to thank you again. And I see your wife. Please thank her for um, all that she does for you and for us. And, thank you, man. <laughs> and I'm she always in the kitchen when you're on Zoom, Bruce? Yes, actually, she typically is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do what I always do, which is, you know, when people ask me why I do this, it's because my mom gave me my big heart. Thank you, Mom. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rick. I always enjoy your presentations. Then thank you, Ken, for, um, for recommending Bruce. Uh, and acting on it promptly, and Bruce, for you to jump in on it. Uh, Ken suggested this in a meeting, and I thought, you know, eh, half, three quarters of the time, you never hear anything more. I heard the next day, I heard from Bruce the next day. Within two days, I talked to Bruce for an hour on the phone. So thank you, Ken. Yes. Thank you, uh, everyone. And thank you again, Doctor. My pleasure. And, uh, I'll be happy to do something on the 31st if you want. Okay, we'll talk. Spasticity might be good. Oh, okay. Only your... <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll be happy to do spasticity on the 31st if you All want. All right, well, it's a plan. <laughs>